morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the camp. First session of the day. So it's the best one. Everybody's wide awake. Uh, my name is David Hernandez. I work at FFW, FFWAGC.com. Uh, we've got a table out front. If you want to come by and talk later. Um, giving away a Super Nintendo. Anybody that wants one, by the table. Uh, today we're going to talk about Composer. Uh, what I wanted to do was go over uh, not just Composer itself, but a lot of the Drupal specific things that are related to Composer, and in particular why people are having problems with Drupal, because Drupal is not a straightforward use case for Composer, right? and that's why a lot of you probably already been having problems with it, and things fail, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, first things first, a lot of this information I'm straight pulling from a tutorial that I've already built that's on GitHub. So if you actually go to my GitHub, which is David Hernandez, um, I have this Composer tutorial, which is a step-by-step -step breakdown that goes through all these different steps to teach you how to actually use Composer. And it's just, it's has a bit of a Drupal use case, but I start from scratch, it's just straight up Composer by itself. Because I think it's important for people to understand how to use Composer on its own. It's just a PHP thing, it's not a Drupal thing. Right? So a lot of things that you're probably copying and pasting and running because you found documentation somewhere, you don't necessarily understand how they work or what those commands are for or what they're doing or why Drupal is such a bad use case, but if you learn how to use Composer, you can use it for anything else. You can use it for Symfony and other PHP applications, things that you just make. So I just went and built this tutorial and a lot of what I'm discussing is literally just copied from here. So you don't need to take notes. You can just go to my tutorial. And it has literally like all, all the same text and commands and everything in it. Okay. Okay, so that's online GitHub, David Hernandez. Hernandez. Okay. So, number one, why do we use Composer? Um, so, Composer is, if you don't know what it is, it's the PHP package manager. Um, if you've been using Node.js or Ruby or any of these other things, or even if you've been a Linux sysadmin and you know how to install things using Yum or AppGet or whatever, those are all package managers. Um, and what they really are, dependency managers. All right, so this is basically the future of everything for PHP. It's not specifically a Drupal thing. Drupal did not invent it. But because Drupal is now in this modern PHP world with Drupal 8, we basically started using Composer. All right, so if you know the fact that Drupal 8 uses Symfony and it uses all these other PHP libraries that Drupal did not create, it uses Composer to go get them. All right, so Composer is the command that you run and you say, go get me Symfony, this version, and, and put it all together and go get Twig and go get all these other different libraries and put them all together to make this application. This is what you would do if you're doing something in Symfony or Laravel or anything else. This is what you do in Node.js when you tell it to install something and then you see it goes and downloads 5,000 different things and sticks them in that Node modules directory. It's still all doing the exact same thing. All right, Composer is just the PHP version of that. This is all run on packages.org. So if you go to packages.org, you will see where all of these different PHP libraries, like their accounts exist. The actual code for the most part is not there. Usually code is in GitHub and different places, but Packages is the organization, the website, whatever, that Composer interacts with to go find these different things. Right? So when you tell your command line, tell Composer, like, go get Symfony or go get Drupal, it communicates to packages.org and goes and finds it. Okay? So you can go here and you can just search through things and find like other PHP libraries that exist for various different things like date libraries and all kinds of other different stuff. Okay, so Drupal uses it, Drupal 8 now uses it. Um, if you were to just download Drupal 8 and take a look at it, you will see that Drupal 8 itself uh, your zip file, your tarball, whatever, when you open it up, you'll see that there's a vendor directory in it. And when you go look inside that, you will see that there's a Symfony directory and a whole bunch of other directories for all the different PHP libraries that Drupal 8 uses, and that's where they all come from. Okay? Again, you can use this for your own thing, so if you're just building a straight PHP application that's completely custom on your own, you can use Composer and go download libraries and use them. Okay? So it is a command line tool um, for a lot of operating systems. It's well, Linux and Mac. It's installed with PHP on Windows. It likely is not. Uh, so you just have to go to uh, go online and you can download Composer and install it and it'll work as part of your PHP. All right. The thing that you really need to understand about this, and this is basically problem number one that people run into, 
is that Composer will use whatever version of PHP is on your command line. So if you go to your command line and you do like PHP dash V, dash dash version, whatever, and whatever you get, whatever binary it's using to run PHP on the command line, that's what it's going to use when you run your Composer campaigns. So if you've got like some web server system that you're using um, where you're running it in like MAMP or Aqueduct Desktop or you've got some Docker set up or whatever, but then you just go to your command line and just run Compose or whatever, it's not going to use the PHP that's like in your container or in Aquadip Desktop or any of the other things. It's going to use the one that's on your command line. Right? So sometimes people run into those problems where they've got some local development environment set up with like PHP 7 in it, and it's running some like local web server inside of it with PHP, and then you go type a Composer command, and it's using like the default built-in PHP that comes with Mac OS. Right, that's something that you have to change. You have to like go make the, just the configuration changes to tell Composer to use that other PHP version that's somewhere else, or run the command inside your Docker container or whatever. Like, so that's one of the problems that people will run into. They won't necessarily use the PHP that your actual website is running. Right. Uh, there's two files that you will encounter. One is the Composer JSON file, right, and that is the file that just contains JSON, but it's all the configuration for your project. All right, we'll take a look at that while I go through these slides. And the other one is your lock file, composer.lock. The lock file is what contains the results of everything that you do. So when you run composer commands, like tell it to actually do an install and build your project, it will read what's in the composer.json file. It'll do a bunch of stuff, like go download all those packages and run scripts and all that. And whatever the result of that is, it writes into the lock file. Right, so you have to sometimes pay attention to what's in the lock file. You use that for troubleshooting because you can go look at it and you see, like, okay, I told you to download Drupal or I told you to download Path Auto module or whatever. What version did it actually download and where did it get it from? If you look inside the lock file, you can find all of that information. Okay, and we'll go over a little bit of that. And then lastly, packages are all downloaded and they're put into a vendor directory, an actual directory called vendor. So that's when, when you download Drupal and you open it up and take a look at it, you'll see that there's a vendor directory in there. When we get started on your project and you start running your Composer commands for the first time, Composer will actually create a vendor directory right in the root where the Composer JSON file is and just stick everything inside there. And that's one of the problems that we'll actually get into. Okay. So how do we get started? The first thing is Composer itself is just a command. It has decent documentation. If you go to getcomposer.org, there is a command line documentation that tells you um, all the different commands and like what they actually do. Uh, it's kind of like a man page. It will show you all of the different arguments that you can use and all that kind of stuff, but of course you have to know like what command you want to use and what you're actually using it for. Uh, but if you need to like find syntax and stuff like that, and what different options you have, you can all find it here on the online documentation. Um, in my tutorial and in this presentation, I point to specific pages. So when I mention a command, I'll, I'll actually provide a link that tells you which, which documentation page to go to to find that command and all the different options for it. To make things a little easier. So like, when I say run the init command, like, I'll tell you actually go to this page in the documentation here. All right. The command itself is its really just the PHP binary, All right? So um, it just runs and whatever options you give it, like install something, set a dependency, add a configuration option or whatever, it's just going to do whatever it tells you to. There's nothing really complicated about installing it. You just download that FAR file that, and you just use it and that's it. So as long as you download it put it in the right place, it'll work. You don't have to like go through some complicated installation or anything like that. Okay. As I said, when you run it, it will use the Composer JSON file for the project that you're in, so whatever directory you're in, and then it will write everything to that lock file. Okay? And then the commands look like this, essentially. This is an example. Um, the way you reference projects is with this vendor slash package naming, and we'll see that in every command that we get to. Okay. So the first one is the most basic command, which is just init. So if you're starting a uh, project for the very first time, you've never used Composer before, uh, once you have it set up, you can just go into empty directory and say Composer init. And it will give you like a little wizard. 
they're like, oh, what's the name of your project? What's your email address? What dependencies do you want? And you can just answer the questions. And then what it'll do is create the Composer JSON file for you and fill that information in. Once you've done that the first couple of times, you realize that like you don't need it because you'll just you can write the Composer JSON file yourself. It's not complicated. It's just JSON. Uh, and most people probably just start with a template file. Like I always just go to another project, copy it, and then just like change the project name in there. So it's just like it's just a file you can edit. Uh, and that's kind of the advantage. Um, some of the commands sometimes feel a little complicated, or you don't always remember them. But all you really need to remember is that the com composer command, for the most part, is just writing what's in the JSON file. So if you want to change what's in there. You don't have to run the commands, you can just edit the file. So if you actually want to add a requirement, the composer command will write the requirement into the JSON file. You could actually open the JSON file and just stick it in there yourself and just like really just type it in there. And fine, then when you run the install commands, it'll just work. Like you don't have to do all that sort of stuff. And that's what I actually do most of the time. I just open the JSON file and I just edit it. It's just easy. Okay, so the init is optional. And you'll probably do it once. I have it in the tutorial, and then once you figure it out, you're like, oh, that's what it does, and then you'll never use it. Okay. So this is what that file looks like. Um, it's a little hard, but if you go to my tutorial, you can just see the file, or if you open any Composer JSON file, they can get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but for the most part, they look the same and have the same thing in them. All right, so if you follow the wizard from init, it'll ask you what's your name, and it wants that vendor slash package naming scheme, right? So if I was making something that I was putting publicly on packages.org, this is what I would do. I'd have to go get an account on packages. So if I went and got one that was David-Hernandez, then this is what I would do. I would say David-Hernandez slash whatever this project is that I'm making, right? Give it a name there. And that's how uh, Composer references everything as this vendor slash package, okay? If it's just your own local project, you can put whatever in there you want and nobody's going to care because it's just, it won't reference it anywhere. All right, so then you can do a description. There are different types that you can set. The types don't really matter that much, but when you're building like a Drupal site, you would just give it the type project. <coughs> There's other different types um, depending on what kind of things that you'd be making and making public, uh, but for the most part, you're probably not going to care about too many of them. You just call everything the project, that's fine. Right. But you can see this is just a JSON file, which is just it's just a JavaScript array. So anytime you want to modify something in this file, you just open the file up and just edit what's in there, and it's fine. You just save the file and then run commands, and it'll just read the file. It's fine. Okay. And then here it has author information. Again, if you're making your own site, you don't care about author information necessarily, so you can just leave it empty, and it wouldn't care. And then your requirements uh, will go here in the bottom. And this is the thing that we'll spend the most time talking about, the requirements. Right. When you add a requirement, that's how you tell Composer, I want you to go get this library. Because right? those PHP libraries, you define them as requirements for your project. So if I say Drupal is a requirement, it will go get Drupal. If it tells Symfony is a requirement, it goes and gets Symfony. Right? And all that goes in that section. Can you address the minimum stability? I'll get to that. Okay. Okay. This is just an example that I'm showing, and then I'll actually go through all the things that I do. All right, so install command is what you would use to actually install the project. So once you get all that stuff in the Composer JSON file, you then run the install command, and that's the command that tells Composer, like, go do work. And that's when it then goes and, like, checks the internet, and talks to packages.org, and downloads everything. So if I wanted to build a project, like build an actual Drupal site, and I did all this in Composer, I could just give you the Composer JSON file. I don't have to give you anything else. I just give you that one file, you run Composer install, and then it reads that file, and it says, oh, you're telling me go get all these things, all these versions of these things, run these scripts or whatever, do all this good stuff, and like build the whole project, right? That's a build process, telling it to do the install. Okay. So it reads the JSON file, does all the work, and then writes the lock file. And the lock file is basically the log of everything that actually did. Right? So you go read it, it's, it's another JSON file, it has everything in there, but it will tell you, I actually went and got this specific version of that module. I got it from this source. These were the options with it, all that kind of stuff. It goes in the lock file. Okay. And then everything it goes and it downloads, it downloads and sticks inside that vendor directory. Uh, the main thing to note, specifically, is that Composer is an enormous memory hog. And that's probably problem number two that everybody experiences. 
So most of the time when you get failures running composer commands, it's actually because it ran out of memory. Um, if you were running it locally, if you're running on a server, VM or something, you would have to, um, this is why I also don't recommend running composer commands like on your production servers. But if you're doing it like on a build server, you have to set your PHP memory limit pretty high. Um, because essentially it has to go to package.org, it has to download all this metadata, and it has to like run computations on all that metadata, and it's like extremely inefficient. Um, Composer is probably the worst package manager of all the ones that exist as far as memory management goes. Um, so if you're, if you're actually running commands and you don't get a useful error, the composer will normally tell you something like, I can't download that package. Right? These versions can, you know, don't work. Like, there's a version conflict, but it'll, it'll like, give you a useful error. If you're running a composer install and it does a bunch of stuff and it reaches a point where it's just like blah, and like you don't understand the error that happens, chances are you ran out of memory. And it just dies. Right? It does that a lot. So I would check that first. To help with that, uh, there is this package uh, called Composer Drupal Optimizations that somebody made. Uh, this is something that came out recently, like not too long ago. Um, so I would recommend taking a look at that. Uh, this is I found this from a blog post from Jeff Geerling, if you know who he is. Um, he found it and then did some performance tests on it and found that it like helped the memory problem by like an order of magnitude, at least. So there are times when like running the composer commands would require like, you know, it would download like 700 megs of data or something like that, and then using the optimizations that was cut down to like 40 megs or something. It was like completely ridiculous how, how much it improved everything um, due to like cache management and all kinds of crazy stuff. So if you're having these problems, take a look at that thing first. Okay. Excuse me, how do you use that? Do you just add it to your project? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I would follow the, there's a, if you go to the GitHub repo for that thing, there's some, there's instructions of what you have to do to get it to work. Okay. All right. So the main command that you really care about is the require command. This is how you tell Composer to go get stuff. So you do Composer require and then you tell it what to go get. So that whole vendor slash package name. Um, and then that's what it will like go to packages.org or wherever it is you tell it to go get it. Um, and then basically we'll write that information into your Composer JSON file, right? So if you're starting from scratch or you have an existing uh, Drupal site and you're gonna use Composer, say download a module, if any of you use Drush, you know you use a Drush command, you like Drush, download, and you give it the module name. All right, this is basically equivalent. You do Composer require, you know, Drupal path, path auto. And then it will go to packages.org and try to figure out how to get that module and it'll write it into your Composer JSON file and all that kind of stuff. And that will become problem number three that we'll talk about. Uh, the format is just like this, composer require vendor slash package name. And that will just go and get essentially whatever is the most recent version or whatever thing you can download based on whatever requirements it has. But what you can also do is add a colon at the end and then specify a version. So if you know you need a specific version or you have some like it needs to be at least this version or below this version, stuff like that, you can tell Composer to do that. And we're gonna get into exactly how those version numbers work. Because that would be the next problem that everybody runs into that's difficult. Uh, but it's not too difficult once you understand. Okay. And then this is what that looks like. So the exact same file, you can see it just goes to the require section here and just adds a line for Drupal. So I told the Composer require Drupal Drupal, and it just adds this into the Composer JSON file. And it automatically writes this 8.6x dev because it just went and got the most recent thing and it said, okay, I can download a dev version because you didn't tell me what to do. And then like, it just adds that line in there. Okay. So every time you tell it to do something, that's what it does. It's just adding another line in here. Right? So that's why I say it's fairly easy once you understand that, you can just open up the file and then just edit it and add another line and stick what you want in there. You don't have to actually use the command if you don't want to. All right, next thing is Composer required dev. So Composer understands the difference between you wanting to build your project for production and you wanting to build it for development. Because in development, you might want additional packages that you don't want in production. 
Right? So on a Drupal site, maybe you want locally to tell it to install Drupal console. Maybe you want to install PHP units, you know, a develop module, like all kinds of other things for your development environment. But you don't want any of those stuff in production. Right? So Composer knows the difference between those two. And it will add two different uh, sections to the JSON file. One that says require, one that says required dev. Right? And we, we can see that in the file itself. Right, so you get a require section, but if you tell it to add something as required dev, it'll make a separate section. And then it knows the difference between the two of those. Right, what you really need to know about this, as I've noted here, is that by default, if you don't tell Composer to do anything different, it will install both of them. All right, so when you say Composer install, it'll look at the require section and the required dev section, and it'll grab everything. Because by default, it assumes that you're a developer running commands in development mode and your local development environment or whatever. So it's like, all right, I'm just going to do everything because uh, just by default, we assume you're the developer. Um, if you don't want what's in the dev section, you have to use the switch. Right? You just tell it dash dash no dev and then it won't install what's in the required dev section. Right. Can you have different versions of the same module in dev and not in dev? Uh, I believe yes, um, and it, it'll have to reconcile it. Um, so the biggest, um, the biggest advantage to using Composer is that it handles the dependency management, not just the downloading of stuff. Because right? the downloading stuff is the easiest part. The more complicated part is like figuring out the version numbers and whether things are okay. Right. So like required dev will override was in the require section, but it still has to do um, calculations to figure out which versions are okay. So if you tell it a version that's in dev that is not actually compatible with other things that it's installing, then you have to see what end result you get. Right? Because you those those packages have dependencies on other things and other things and other things. So you always see, like, I could put three things in here and tell Composer to install, but Composer won't install three things. It'll install like 50 things. Right, because then those packages depend on other things, and those packages depend on other things, and other things, and other things, and the like, composer is what goes and figures that all out. All right, so that's one thing that we'll, we'll take a look at a little bit, but you'll notice that like, if something doesn't come out right, it's usually because you have to go and take a look at those versions and what things are depending on what. And usually composer will give you those messages when it does the install. If you actually look at what it's doing as stuff is scrolling by, like don't just ignore it. Like actually read it, it'll say like, okay, I'm trying to download this version, I can't, I have to go get this version because of this package is dependent on this and blah, 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 blah. It's like doing all that work for you. And then it'll show you what the end result is. Assuming that the end result is something that you can actually do. Right? Sometimes you, have, you can actually tell it to try to install something and you have two completely incompatible versions of something. Right? Like if I told it to download two different things that both use Symphony, and they both use two different versions of Symphony. They require two different versions of Symphony. Like it'll have a collision and it'll stop and say, like, I can't do this. Yeah, my like use that. case was having private repositories for modules that are in development versus what I want going out into production. In the CI. So that's different. I'll actually get into that, adding the private repositories, and I'll show you how to do that. Okay. So that's that section there. Is there a log file? Uh, yeah. Composer does have a log file. Uh, but for the most part, the end result, as, as soon as that is successful, um, you want to check the lock file itself. No, log versus lock. lock. Yeah, there is a lock. Okay, sorry. All right. <clears throat> All right, so this is the other big problem that people really get into that, that they, you know, and when people say they hate Composer, it's the version constraints that they have problems with. So the version constraints are you don't just tell Composer, I want version 8.1 of something. Where right, you tell it, like, I want at least 8.0, and Composer will go and download newer versions. Like, that's the whole point. It's, it's, it's a dependency manager. So it will update things for you if that's accept, you know, acceptable to you. Right? There's newer versions of some package when you tell it to run the build again, it'll go download the newer versions of everything. Right? So it'll constantly be updating things for you as long as you give it the right commands and tell it the right version of the for everything. Right? And this tricks people out because some of these are a bit confusing. All right, the easiest thing, this is why I put all this in the table, is if you tell Composer an exact version of something, it will only download that version. All right, so if I told Composer to go get Drupal Core 8.5.1, like I have here, and I actually wrote that in the file, 8.5.1, in quotes, no symbols or anything, it will download 8.5.1. 
and Composer will never update it. Right. So people put that in a file and then they can get confused. I'm like, I tell Composer, Composer update and because a new Drupal core version came out and it doesn't update why. Because you told it an exact version to use and it doesn't care that you're running the update command. You told it what version to go get and that's the only version it's ever going to get. Right? That's fine when you know you need an exact version of something and you don't want Composer to ever screw up and download 8.5.2 because you know like, that's going to break something you're doing. It will stick to that exact version. Okay? You can do a wildcard, so if I do 8.5 star, it'll basically download any version of 8.5. So 8.5.0, 8.5.1, 8.5.2, 8.5.3, whatever. Whatever is the newest one that it finds when it goes to download something, that's what it will download. So if you built this thing a year ago and you were using 8.5.0, and now it's up to 8.5.9, when you run it again, it'll go and get 8.5.9, because okay? you put a wildcard in it. Right? And that's simple. Everybody understands wildcards, right? Okay. And then the next one is range. Range is fairly simple as well. You can tell it like greater than or equal to this, less than or equal to that, and it'll do exactly that. Okay? That's not too complicated either. So greater than or equal 8.5, less than 8.6 means any version of 8.5 it'll go download. It'll never download 8.6. Right? Could you use that on the command line just like that? Yeah. And then there's a uh, stability constraint. You can tell it to download dev versions of modules. Like if there's dev branches for this package in GitHub and you want it to go get that, you can do that as well. I'll get a little bit more into that later. We'll talk about the stability and stuff like that. But the two things that really confuse people when they see this, and what I would say a lot of times, even people who are writing packages, when they put the stuff in their own composer files, kind of do wrong and confuses people is sort of the difference between using this tilde and using the caret. Okay? And this is actually decently explained in Composer's documentation if you go look at it. It gives you like a table and examples and stuff like that. What you really need to know is that these both will increment. When I say increment, it means even if I have 8.50 written in there, it can download newer versions of stuff, right? Unless you just have the exact <laughs> version at the top. Right? But if I have tilde 8.5.0, Composer can download a newer version of this package. Right? 8.51, 2, 3, whatever. What it increments is the last digit. Whatever the last digit is. And what confuses people is that sometimes it's just written as three digits and sometimes it's written as two. So you might look at a file where someone wrote 8.5.0 and then look at another file and somebody wrote 8.5. That's not the same thing, right? When you use the tilde, it will increment the last one, the rightmost one. So it'll increment the zero, but if you only wrote it with two digits, it will actually increment the five because it sees the difference between you using two and you using three, right? If you, if you use the caret, it will increment the rightmost two. So it will do the zero and it will do the file five, even though three of them are written down. Right? And that's basically the difference between the two of them. Is it digits or the last component of the last, last period? It could be a multi digit Yeah, that's what I mean. That's a, yeah. Yes, thank you. Whatever, I don't know if those are technically octets or whatever, whatever, yeah. I call the, the three spaces. So if you have two of them, I mean, this is semantic versioning, so it's really the major version, the minor version, the patch version. So if you have the minor version and the patch version, it will increment both or just one or the other, right? And that's what really screws people up. People will use the tilde, and sometimes they'll write it with three, sometimes they'll write it with two. And that means different things, okay? I don't know why everybody doesn't just write it with three always. This is just, I'd just be mandatory. Like, what are you saving by not putting that in zero? Just if, I, everybody up. if I do the caret with two, what would that be? So if you do the caret with two, it will still only do the rightmost one. So the, the main thing to learn about pretty much all of these is that it, Composer will never update the major version. So it will never go from eight to nine. Because that's con in semantic versioning, that's considered a completely different thing. So no matter what you do, if you screw it up, Composer just will never do it. Because they're like, oh, I know that that's, that's going to be a completely different thing. Version nine, and it doesn't do it. You'd have to go in and actually tell it. 
you'll do that. So that's the one place where Composer will save you and won't accidentally download some completely incompatible version of something. Uh, at least from a semantic versioning standpoint, because it knows kind of two completely different things. Okay? So, implementing that, again, you can just write that in the command line if you want. Right? And so this command during Composer requires Drupal console and then caret 100 dash dash dev and then that will stick it inside the required dev room. Or if you want, just go ahead and file and stick it in there. And that'll work too. Right? It'll do the same thing. Okay. Now, minimum stability is the thing you were asking about, Steve, that was in that file. Um, Composer can recognize stability flags that are part of packages and the version, so it knows if something's dev or if something's in RC or if something's full release. Um, and you can set the minimum stability. So if you, um, if there is a dev version of Drupal Core and you set your minimum stability to stable, it will only download the stable versions. Right? So whatever is currently like 8.6 point something or whatever, it will only download that. It won't accidentally download the dev version of Drupal for you. But if you put minimum stability dev, then it will. If you don't tell it what to do, you just say Composer require Drupal, Drupal or Drupal Core or Drupal Path Auto or Symphony or whatever, it'll say, well, minimum stability, you said dev is okay. The most recent thing I can find in that repo is a dev version. Well, that's the one I'll go get. Right? More than likely, in production, you probably don't want that. Right? Um, but if you're like just getting started with the project, you might do that. Uh, sometimes we have to do that in Drupal world because everybody knows that half the modules out there are always in dev version and don't have full releases or they're stuck in RC or you know or beta or whatever. So you have to actually do that because if you don't, it's, it won't do it unless you tell it like an exact version that's the dev version. Right? It'll save you from that. It'll try not to download a dev version unless you say it's okay. So if we do minimum stability stable. But we want to override just one module that's a dev because we need it. We can do that. You'd have to go in, yes, and specify, specify that, that in the uh, JSON yeah. for that. This is when you have a lot of these settings, they're for the things where you haven't given Composer an answer. You haven't told it ahead of time what's okay. So if I tell it to like go get a module and I haven't specified versions or I haven't given like specific constraints or things like that, it has to make a guess. And it uses this to figure out what level of guessing it can do, what it can get away with. Okay. So it looks like this. Right? If I did Composer required Drupal without specifying any versions and I had minimum stability set to dev, it'll actually go and get 8.6.x dev. Or right now, 8.7, the slides are old. Right? But if I set my minimum stability to stable, and I did the exact same command, I would get whatever is the current stable version of Drupal. And so when I wrote this, it was 8.5 something. Okay, now it would be like 8.6 something. Okay. So that will, I didn't specify a version, but it would save you from accidentally getting a development version of something if you didn't want that. Again, you don't have to do dev or stable, you can also do RC, you can do uh, beta, there's a, a couple other options. Now, here's the other thing. So there's two options, and I usually include both of these. There's the minimum stability, so what's the minimum thing that's okay to go get. And then there's this other option for prefer stable. So I recommend you add that and just set it to true. So what you can do here is you can set your minimum stability to be dev, and so that basically gives Composer permission to download development versions of packages. But then if you add this option to say prefer stable, that means I'm letting you download dev uh, modules or packages, whatever they are. Uh, I'm saying that that's okay if you have to. But I would prefer that you don't. So if you set this, then it would download Drupal 8.6. It wouldn't download a development version of it because it doesn't have to, right? Um, it would only download a dev version of a module if it had to. Right, like if it couldn't find a stable, compatible version that matches all the other requirements that you have in your project, then it will go and get the development one. 
Otherwise, it'll look for whatever is the most stable version of something instead. Right? So use both of these options. Set your minimum stability and set prefer stable to true. And that'll probably save you some headaches. Okay. And if you look at any example composer JSON files, like you find on GitHub for other projects and stuff like that, you will probably find both of these. They should just like right next to each other in the JSON file. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to go over some specific things that are related to Drupal and why a lot of this is really hard in Drupal. If you're just doing like some other PHP project on your own, some, something custom, this is not that complicated. But then we try to do it with Drupal, it does not work. None of it works. It does not work at all out of the box. Um, part of the reason for that is because Drupal is not, you're not, you're not using Drupal as a library. You're not telling it to go get Drupal as a package and install it in your project. Drupal already is a project that's like complete and built because it's, you know, it's whatever. It's like 18 years old now and has been written forever. Like, so you go tell Dru uh, uh, Composer to go get Drupal, well, it goes and like downloads Drupal. So you get like a directory with all the Drupal stuff in it and all the modules and all the include files and index.php inside of it and all this sort of stuff. Like it's already a built product. It's already a package on its own that's like meant to just be run as a website. It's not a library. So when you tell it to do that by default from Composer, Composer's like, okay, I went and got it, and then I stick it in the vendor directory. And you're like, well, that's not gonna work. Because all the stuff that you need is inside that. Like, you need it to be the project, not be a library that you're sticking inside the vendor directory. That doesn't work, right? It gets all screwed up. So there's a bunch of different things that we have to do to actually make it work, and like basically force Drupal to fit this model that it was not intended to fit. Uh, the one good news is a lot of this is being worked on. So a lot of these scripts and these funny things that try to get Drupal to work well with Composer are actually getting added into Drupal itself to make this easier. But there's a, a number of things that you have to do to actually make this work correctly. Particularly the directory structure, right? Because Drupal can't live inside the vendor directory. Drupal has to live in the directory that like your project is. Like it has to be that directory, right? And modules are not PHP packages. So you don't want your modules to be in the vendor directory either. Like your modules have to be in the modules directory, like where everything else is, not inside the vendor directory. Like that stuff doesn't work. Okay. So step number one is um, Composer has options for you to add repositories. Right. And this is what you were asking about. Can I tell it to go get something from GitHub or like a private server or something like that? Yes, you can do that. By default, it looks to packages.org for everything. But if you want to look somewhere else, you can just tell it to do that by adding repositories. And you have to do that for uh, Drupal, right? Because all the modules that Drupal have are on Drupal.org. They're not on packages.org. So if you actually tell uh, Composer, go get Drupal Path Auto or Drupal Meta Tag Module or whatever, it doesn't know what you're talking about because those things don't exist on packages.org. They're on Drupal.org. Right? But Drupal.org actually has a server that works with Composer, and you can tell it how to use that, and then all of a sudden it will magically go find all your Drupal modules and stuff. <coughs> so, this is all you have to do, is you add a repository section inside the Composer JSON file, just like everything else, it's just an array, you just add that section in there, and then you just add this. So you can tell it to add GitHub repos, and all that sort of stuff, but for Drupal what you do is, you set this type as Composer because Drupal has basically like its own packages server. Oh, there we go. Um, what this thing is actually called is a facade. So Drupal.org has its own packages facade, the Composer facade that's at packages at Drupal.org slash eight. So once you add this to your Composer JSON file and then run Composer commands like Composer require Drupal slash beta tag then suddenly it'll go get the module, because now it knows where to go get it. Okay. Okay. Uh, the second thing, uh, Composer knows how to run scripts, which is really handy. So if you just write a PHP script or whatever, you can add it to your Composer JSON file in a script section, and then it will run the scripts. It can run scripts before it goes and gets requirements, after it gets them, before it does install, after it does install. There's a bunch of different things that trigger scripts. Um, and there's some public ones that are specific to Drupal that you need that do things like build um, your Drupal project correctly as a Drupal project. So like stick your modules in the modules directory, put everything in the root, index.php, 
don't stick Drupal in the menu directory and all that kind of stuff. You need these special scripts that handle that correctly. Okay, we'll take a look at some of those. Um, if you go download some example projects, one of which I'll show at the end, that are specific to Composer that are on Drupal.org. If you go to Drupal.org's documentation for Composer, there's these like really complicated, unhelpful instructions <coughs> that are really big and long that tell you how to use Composer. And it's like, just use one of these starter projects, or blah, 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 blah. And they're like, okay, whatever. And it's like, copy and paste this command. And you don't understand what any of that stuff is. If you actually go look at those things, they all have a Composer JSON file, and they all have these things in them. Right, so I'm just explaining basically all the little pieces that are inside those starter projects. And one of them is they all have these script sections that are running these scripts to set up a Drupal project correctly so that you don't have to figure out how to do all this sort of stuff. Okay. All right, so that's what that looks like. So you just end up with another section, scripts, and then you tell it what script to run. So here, what we're actually doing is we're requiring this project called Drupal Scaffold which is one of the, the common public projects that actually handles the scaffolding for you. And by scaffolding, we mean like, oh yeah, we have to actually put these folders in the right place and stuff like that and not dump everything in the vendor directory and all that. Okay, and then in the script section, you just tell it, this is the script I want it to run, okay? which is actually part of the scaffold project. Again, you don't have to like memorize this stuff. If you go look at all those other starters, they all have this stuff in there, you just copy and paste it. Like, I don't, I don't memorize what this is, I just copy and paste it from a template I already have. Right? Somebody else has already done the work for you. Okay? But that's what that is. I'm just explaining what that thing is that's in the file. Okay? Then Composer, in your Composer JSON file, has an extra section where you can basically provide metadata that's needed for like these scripts and other things that Composer is going to do. Okay? And you will see that in all of these starters. Extra and then something like this. So one of those scripts uses these installer paths where we actually tell Composer, no, this is where I want to actually put all my stuff. So if I tell you to go get a Drupal module, don't stick it in the vendor directory, stick it in this directory instead. All right, every single one of these, when you open it up, you will see that written in there. So in my particular project, I use doc root as the document root that's inside like my repo, like where my project is. If you don't use doc root and you use something else like web or something, just go and edit the file and just change that from doc root to web or whatever else you call it, whatever your path is. That's fine. Like even if you should download those starter kits things, just open the JSON file and just edit it. That's all you gotta do. You don't have to do anything else. Nothing fancy. You're just telling it when you download Drupal Core, this is where I want you to stick it. When you download something that's a module, that has type Drupal dash module, right? Remember in the very beginning when I did the init and I said you should put type project? Well, all the Drupal modules, when they make themselves and put themselves on Drupal.org, when people make modules, they set their type as Drupal dash module. So the composer downloads that and looks at that file and says, what are you? Oh, you're type Drupal dash module. And then it looks inside my composer JSON file and says, oh, I'm told that if something is Drupal dash module, stick it inside this directory. Right, doc root modules can trim, and then this is a token for the name of the, the module. Right? If you want a different path, you organize your folders a different way, you just go edit that file and just change it. That's it. It's like you don't have to like run commands or do anything special, you just go edit the file before you set your project up and it'll just it'll put it where you tell it to put it. Okay? And like same thing, drush commands. It's like put your drush commands in here. You want a different place, just edit that and just tell it a different place. It's not complicated, just add the phone. Okay. All right, big thing, big topic. There are two different things that you can get from Composer. One is Drupal slash Drupal, one is Drupal slash core. Don't use Drupal slash Drupal. Just don't ever use it again. You've like, you got all the information you need from this presentation, go use my tutorial, never use Drupal slash Drupal. You tell it to use Drupal slash Drupal, that's basically the same as if you downloaded Drupal from Drupal.org. Like, if Drupal slash Drupal contains a folder with like core and the modules directory and the themes directory and index.php and all that, all that in one folder, right? That doesn't work. But that was created originally, like three years ago. Somebody said, oh, we'll just put Drupal up on packages and it'll be the whole thing. And you're like, no, it's a dumb idea anyway. Like, it doesn't work because the structure of the folder and directory like, doesn't work, right? So then uh, the core team made a separate version, which is Drupal slash core. 
And this is basically just what's in that core folder. So if you download Drupal from Drupal.org, you unzip it, and you look inside, you have the modules directory, the themes directory, miscellaneous directory, and it's a core folder. And that contains all the stuff that's in core, the modules and the themes and everything that's in there. Drupal slash core from Composer is just that core folder with stuff in it. Right? And that's much better, because then when you use the scaffold scripts and stuff, it knows to take that core folder and like stick it in the root of your project or in your doc root or your web root or whatever. And then goes and makes a modules folder, like this is how it figures out how to like build your directories correctly and all that sort of stuff. Okay? You'll figure that out and you'll see this in all the starter projects. They're all written like that. So just just all you need to know is from now on you're gonna use Drupal slash core, you're not going to use Drupal slash Drupal. Right? If I actually go here in GitHub, if I try to go here in GitHub, this is the repo. And you can see this is just, this is Drupal 8. And it's just the contents of that core folder if you went and downloaded it from Drupal. Okay? It's all it is. Okay. You're on 27. Thank you. Okay. So, other stuff. Updating, right? So now you've done all this stuff for the first time and say a new version of Drupal core comes out or a new version of a module or a library or whatever, you just want to update stuff, what do you do? You just run Composer update. If you do that, it will check everything that's in your lock file, the Composer file, and tries to update to see if there's a newer version of something out, right? So remember the, the, the version constraints? If I said 8.5.0 and anything higher is okay, well, it'll then check when I tell it to run an update. So if I had last down an E51, is there an E52 out now? It'll go look, and then it'll download it if there is, if it can. If you don't want it to do everything, then you just specify which package that you want, right? So if all I want to do is update Drupal Console, you just run update Drupal Console. And this is the same as Drush, so right? if you use Drush, you, just, you can tell it one module, or you just put spaces and tell it as many as you want. It'll go do all of them. Right, so you can do multiple, you just put a space between them. And it'll go and get each one. You don't need version constraints or anything, because you're telling it to update a thing that it already has in the Composer JSON file. Alright, now last, which is really helpful for Drupal projects, is, well not last, but get there, is Composer, uh, there's a, a, a package that exists, this is the URL for it in GitHub, it's called Composer Patches. Uh, this is not a Drupal specific thing, um, you can use this for any PHP, any Composer thing. If you use this Composer Patches package, then in your extra section, like where you put the installer paths and the scripts and all that other stuff, you can actually specify patch files. So if you know you need to download a module and then you've got a patch for that module, you can specify the patch. And what Composer will do is it will download the module and then it will get the patch and it will apply the patch for it. All right, so this is how you're using Composer as a build system. You can tell it, go get this module. Like, you don't have to tell it, like, I had to patch a module and then actually stick the patch version someplace in a private repo and tell it to get that version instead. You don't have to do that. Tell it to just go get the original, here's the patch file, apply the patch file. Okay? So that's all you have to do here. You tell it, in the patches section, you tell it uh, vendor slash package name that this patch file applies to. Right, you just give it a label and you just tell it where to get the patch file. So it'll download the patch file and it'll apply it to the thing that is installed. Um, in this case, we're doing it with the Drupal module, so you actually give it a URL to the patch file that's on Drupal.org. So if you go into issue queue and somebody has a patch file there and they keep like it's been uploaded as a file, you just grab that URL. Um, but if you want, and if you don't want to rely on that, you can download the patch file and just like put it inside your repo. So you can just like put a patches folder in there and stick all your patch files in there. And then just give it a local path. Right? So you can do you can do just like dot dot slash patches slash whatever patch file is. And you'll know to grab it inside your project and apply it that way. That's probably the better way to do it instead of relying on going to the internet and trying to find the file. Just just include it inside your repo. Okay. okay. 
Now this is the last thing, and this is what you're going to find on the documentation on Drupal.org, is Composer has this create project command. Um, and so what that does is it will clone an existing project and use it as like your start base for that project. That you're doing. So when you go on Drupal.org and you look at the Composer documentation, there's just, I think there's at least three of them that are there. We will say, hey, use these as a starting point. Don't try to do it yourself. Just use one of these things. What you need to know is when you run that command, all it's basically doing is cloning that project. Like, like a literal git clone. It's like goes and clones it from GitHub, sticks it in a directory that you told it to, and then runs Composer install. Right, so you can just go to GitHub and download it. You can go grab whatever stuff that starter project has. You can look at it. If you don't like what's there, you can just edit the JSON file and then run the install yourself. Like that's all fine. Right, but what you need to know is that this acts as a starting point. It's not like you telling Composer to get another package like any other. So you can't tell it to update this thing. Usually that's fine because you're just starting and using it as the starting point, but like once you start, then it's on you. Right? You don't tell Composer update and expect it to pull updates from that starter package. Right? So if the guy who's maintaining it like up, added new script to it or something, and you're like, Composer update, it's not gonna go and like download those scripts from the starter package. You have to download them yourself. Like, this is just a starting point and then you're on your own. Okay? Uh, Right, and that's what this looks like. Um, you basically will get this command usually when you see that on Drupal.org, something like this big long command that tells you just copy and paste this into the command line. Right, well, this is, I can tell you exactly what this thing is doing, right? Just want to explain these components. Uh, so it's just compose a create project, right? That's the first part you see in there. Compose a create project. And like, what do you want? Right, and then this thing is actually the starter project and where it's located. So the vendor name was Drupal-Composer slash, and then this thing is called Drupal slash project. And like this shows you people are really bad at naming things. And like, why did you have to call it Drupal project? Just call it starter kit or something. It would be a lot more obvious what it is. It's like, I don't need the word Drupal twice in the same command. Okay, and then just like anything else, you colon and give it a version number. Because that thing's on GitHub and it has versions. Usually you'll just want whatever the most recent version is. That's why usually we specify a dev version. Because it's like whatever is there currently can do that. Right? That's my starting point. Okay? So that all that works just like all the other composer commands. You're just doing a vendor package name and a version number. Okay? And then I have this dot. Sometimes you see the commands actually have something written in there because you're giving it a folder name or a path of where this thing gets downloaded. Because again, what it's actually doing is going to the GitHub repo and cloning it. So it's just like if you do git clone, you have to, if you don't specify like a path, it'll try to clone into the directory you're in. Or you give it a directory name, and it'll create that directory and try to clone the git repo into that directory. Well, this is doing the exact same thing. So you can't do this in a directory that has stuff in it. All right, and that's what screws people up. They think like, oh, I'm gonna convert my existing Drupal 8 project into a composer project. I'll use the starter kit. I'll go into my current directory for my project and like run this command. It's not gonna work because your directory has stuff in it. Right? This all needs to go inside of an empty directory. It's a starting point. You're starting. Okay. So this is a command, compose a create project. This is the vendor, right? This is the path. And then stability dev. Right? As we looked at the Composer JSON file, there was the minimum stability option in it. Well, this is the command line option that sets that. Like, how does that get into the file? You specify stability dev. When you run the command, it'll put that minimum stability inside the Composer JSON file. And if you don't do that, then it can't go get this 8.x dev version. Because right? it won't have minimum stability dev. Right? So you're actually just putting this in the command. And then no interaction just means like don't ask any questions and stuff. That's the standard thing. It'll just go download it and won't ask any questions. It'll just write it and go. All right, so this thing is big and long, but it's actually not that complicated. It really just has a couple of different components to it, and that's it. And you can change those if you want to. Okay. And that's that. So things to remember. Uh, and this is a, a big thing. Composer will not install modules for you. It's not Drush. 
It doesn't know anything about Drupal and doesn't care. So if you tell it to go get MetaTag or Path Auto or some other Drupal module, or Bootstrap, whatever, its only responsibility is to go get the code you downloaded and like whatever other stuff you tell it to do, set up instructions or whatever. It doesn't actually go into your Drupal site and install it like Drush will. It doesn't know anything about that. It doesn't care. Right, so you can download the code, but then you have to actually do things to make it install. So either a script in the build process, or like log into your Drupal site and go to extend and check the box off and get okay. Or then use Drush, tell Drush to install it, whatever. It does not get The same thing with updating. If you tell it to update, it will download the updated code, but it's not gonna run any update scripts that come with the module. You still have to tell Drupal to run the update. Right? It doesn't care about any of that. All it does is downloads code. That's it. Okay? Uh, be mindful of the lock file. If you're having problems or the composer doesn't download something and you don't know why, check the lock file because the lock file is the result of everything that it does. The lock file gets very big, but you can find everything related to that package in there. It will tell you where it got it from. It will tell you the exact version. It will tell you why. All the stuff that you need to know. Things like the author information, like all that kind of stuff that's part of whatever package it downloads will be inside the lock file. And you can usually troubleshoot problems that way. Uh, think ahead, how you manage Composer as a team. Uh, what I encourage people is to do, if possible, is have one person managing Composer for the project, not every developer. Uh, because I find that people run into problems when they're doing that. Someone will like work on some code for a pull request, they're like, I needed this library, then like they update the composer JSON file, and then some other dev is working on something else, and then somebody has to figure out how are we merging all this stuff together, and it gets all screwy, and like, why did you download that version of that? And, like, I needed that version of that, and blah, blah, blah. And it just causes like giant headaches when they're doing that kind of stuff. I, I think it makes more sense to just have like the team lead do that. So like let the, your team lead or whatever the architect is or whatever be like just have one person designated as the one that's actually managing the composer file because that's it's really less about the code than it is about like the build process for everything. So that's really should just be one person I think doing that. So they can keep an eye on everything and make sure that you're not screwing everything up and people are getting trying to install different versions of different things and having different requirements and making messes. Right? That's where I find all these messes. Right? Especially then if you're trying to, as a team lead, review pull requests, which also have composer changes in them that have been committed. So now like, somebody wrote two lines of code, but then like pull request is gigantic because it actually went and you included like all of like the vendor packages. Like, oh, it also updated Symphony as part of this, and I included that as the pull request. So it's like I'm not reviewing like these 5,000 files that changed. Okay. Uh, read the messages. Composer will tell you why it didn't work. So if you tell it to update and then see it didn't update, they'll look at what it was doing. There will be a message in there that says nothing to download. But if you look above, it'll tell you why. It'll say, was trying to download this version. Can only do this because some other package required a specific version, so it couldn't get the newer version of that. Like, it tells you that in the messages. Um, but like I said, unless you run out of memory, and that's the one time when the messages won't make sense. It'll just bar from the screen and it, you won't know why. Okay. And then, of course, it can be slow, which is why I do not recommend that people run Composer uh, fully as part of a build process, definitely not in production, because you're reliant on the internet and Composer is slow. So I, I tell people to commit the vendor directory. All right, so do whatever you have to do to build your project. It will make the vendor directory and we'll go get packages. I don't see anything wrong with committing the vendor directory as part of your project. And then when you have to deploy it, all you have to do is push that code. And there's no compelling reason not to do that because that's the way we used to do it anyway. I don't need the production servers or the build servers to like run the composer commands and then take half an hour or fail or have some DNS issue. Or by the time you actually push something, a new version of some package came out and you weren't paying attention to your version constraints and actually downloaded the new one and something broke. Right? But screwy things happen like that during the build process. Control all of that yourself as a developer while you're doing it. QA can take care of it, look at everything, like the code that you know is going to be there, you need to see it when it's there and just deploy that code, okay? And if you, you will have much uh, fewer problems when you do it that way. Okay, and that's my last slide, so that's it.
a question? Yeah, I was wondering, is there a case where you would want different dependencies uh, in your development set up then on a server where you'd have like special dev dependencies, which would be some sort of case for running compiler or composer like install on a server environment or something like that? Do you know what I mean? If you want like dev only packages or something like that? I mean, you could, well, you could especially for something like you're actually running tests. And so in your require section, you'd have things like PHP unit in it. And then you'd have like your sandbox server would install that and then run automated tests. Um, so you could do stuff like that in your require section. And you'd want that require dev, not in the require section, because you don't want that in production. So you would essentially like do a non-dev install in an environment different than whatever is like you would install. Well, but if you're, all right, so what the thing is, if your environment is so different that you need different PHP packages on like a build server versus your production server, your local server, then that's a different problem that you need to fix. Okay. All right, because you're essentially trying to do development on a system that's different than your production system, so much so that you need different code, and that's going to bring in time, in all kinds of problems that have nothing to do with the code. So you want to take care of that. So how do you manage, uh, have a multi-site environment where you have your main composer in the main default uh, site, and then you have multi-sites, so multiple websites within your application that want to have different modules that you don't necessarily want everyone to have. Um, so if you're talking about, about Drupal, mm -hmm. um, that's a little different. You're going to have problems with that because composer is not going to know, like in the extra section, it's not going to know what site you're referring to, where it has to put that module. So you'd have to either do it manually or like manage the sites in separate instances. Right? Because Composer only cares about one code base. Right. right? It doesn't have, it doesn't understand Drupal, it doesn't have a concept of looking at multiple sites. If you use different modules, it's not going to have a way of managing that. Okay. Uh, the only thing I've seen some people do is they actually um, essentially have one Composer JSON file that's like the whole uh, like the site part, mm -hmm. and then each of the sites in the multi-site are treated as separate projects and have their own composer JSON file. And then there you can do some stuff where you can tell it to like go get modules and stuff like that, but it gets, it gets complicated. It's like it becomes overhead. When they did, when they made it different sites, did they have a different code base entirely, or just the modules and themes were different? You could do it in different ways, but I would say you'd have the whole code base. Oh. So that you don't have to worry about it. Right. Because then, anytime you're sharing stuff, you're more likely to have problems. Yeah. Because then what happens when one of those sites can't update your core yet, what the other ones do, but your main composer file is trying to update your core. Right? Right. So then you have to like special use cases for everything. Right. You're better off just completely separate. Right. Thank you. On, on 32, uh, slide 32. Yes. Uh, now you're saying um, this is going to install the empty, it wants the empty directory. The way I have it written there, which is the dot, is telling you to install the current directory. Right. Um, and But it's got to be empty. So yes. is there any case where you would install it someplace else and then move it work into a directory that's already loaded? Because I, I, mean, I guess technically you could. I don't know why you would. I don't, you can't well, I, I guess it's like um, I was having issues trying to get this thing installed. Uh, on, I, in a, I guess in a live environment. Um, uh, okay, that would be problem number one. It wouldn't be even in a live environment. Right. Well, that's at the time. That's when I was originally doing. It. Um, I mean, the one thing where I might move stuff around is like if I did this to create a compose uh, a new Drupal site, like trying to convert an existing one. Right. But what I would do this in a directory and then go to the existing one and copy its files. Well, that's what I was getting at. Right. So, but I would so. run this in a directory that has stuff in it, or an empty directory, and then copy from the other thing. Right. That exists. Okay. So that's what I was getting at. So that's an acceptable alternative. I mean, not in a way of managing.